Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. Well, today on Body of Wonder, we have uh, the distinguished Dr. Michael Balick joining us. He's really a leading scientist in the field of ethnobotany. He's also a longtime friend and colleague of mine. Uh, we were both uh, students at the Harvard Botanical Museum long ago. He was a graduate student. I was an undergraduate, and then I was in medical school when he was a graduate student. And we were both studying under Professor uh, Richard Evan Schultes. We'll talk about him some in the podcast. So we have a lot of connections. And about 80 years of combined experience in ethnobotany. Yes. <laughs> well, let's get Michael on. For more than four decades, Dr. Michael Balak has studied the relationships between plants and people in the field known as ethnobotany. He is vice president and director of the Institute of Economic Botany at the New York Botanical Gardens. Most of Michael's research takes place in remote regions of the tropics, where he works with indigenous cultures to document plant diversity and the traditional utilization of medicinal plants. He has served on advisory panels for the National Institutes of Health and is on the board of trustees of the American Botanical Council. Dr. Balak has authored more than 150 scientific papers and written multiple books. Most recently, he authored Plants, People, and Culture, The Science of Ethnobotany with Paul Cox. Welcome, Michael. Oh, it's great to be here, Victoria and Andy. Wonderful to see you. Same. Well, Michael, I want to begin by having you define ethnobotany and speak a bit about your work. Well, ethnobotany is the relationship between plants, people, and culture. And back in the late 1800s, a young professor of anthropology got up before a meeting of the American Anthropological Association and said, I'd like to define ethnobotany, create a new word, define it as the study of primitive peoples and their uses of plants. And as we now know, uh, those people which Harshberger referred to as primitive are actually much more sophisticated in their knowledge of the environment, in their knowledge of uh, many, many things than we are, and we are seeking to learn from them. Ethnobotanists go to remote parts of the world. I've had the privilege of working in the Amazon and Central America. I currently work in the Western Pacific in Micronesia and Melanesia. Uh, Melanesia being where I work is Fiji and Vanuatu, uh, Micronesia, Koshrai, and Palau. But we also work in urban areas. New York City is an extraordinary center of diversity. It turns out in New York City, our residents speak up to 800 different languages. And that means 800 different cultures. And most of these are immigrant groups that have brought a lot of their practices with them when they came to New York City. And so for 30 years, perhaps, we've been looking at the immigrant uses of plants in New York City, not only what they bring with them, but how they adapt, how they learn from other cultures, how, for example, uh, Dominican healers in Washington Heights interact with Chinese pharmacists in Chinatown and what they learn from each other. We've been working with Jamaican communities. My colleague, Ina Vandebroek, is, is really the lead in this urban ethnobotany program. Urban ethnobotany mean, uh, being a, a word we, we actually coined to focus on urban environments and immigrant and diaspora cultures. Michael, you and I have known each other for a very long time, and we both had the uh, privilege and good fortune to study under Richard Evans Schultes, the director of the Harvard Botanical Museum, who's considered the father of modern ethnobotany. Uh, you were his graduate student. Uh, he was my mentor as an undergraduate, and then we were both on the research staff of the Harvard Botanical Museum. Yes, those, those actually were magical times, because as you remember, there were 15 or 20 students and associates who were working all over the world, right? And they would come back to the lunch table and we'd hear stories 
you know, the stuff that dreams were made of. I want to hear a story from each of you because I know how influential Richard Evan Schultes was to each of you and that there are some fascinating stories to be told. Well, let's see. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, so this was in the uh, early 1960s, the counterculture was just beginning to develop in Cambridge. And uh, marijuana was just making its appearance. And uh, Schultes gave a, a section of his lectures in his Introduction to Eco Economic Botany course on uh, drug plants, on psychoactive plants. And he mentioned cannabis briefly, but he really knew nothing about it. And I was looking into the literature. There's very little written about it. There's been almost no research on it. And I said to him, you know, this, you want to take an interest in this because this is becoming very prominent and there's not much about it. And uh, he shook his head, and uh, but it did kindle an interest in him. And then he became you know, a great researcher of the botanical origins of cannabis and began going around as an expert witness in cannabis cases. Uh, and it was quite wonderful to see that develop in him. What I remember the most is Biology 104, Plants and Human Affairs, and how he would reach into his freezer and pull out specimens and samples from around the world. If you've never held a 10-pound sugar beet in your hand, it came out of the freezer and you could you could really learn by touching and feeling and seeing and at the poison plants lecture he would take his blow gun load it with a curare dart thankfully not not covered with curare and shoot it across the room into a target you know <laughs> and and the students were just shocked I used to say that that was the only course uh, in my academic career in which I learned anything practical. There was one lab on making soap. There was one on making ink. At the first lab that I remember, he had a Mexican graduate student, and that student's wife came in and made a typical Mexican meal. It was tortillas and guacamole. I mean, things. this was amazing. So we were introduced to all that you know, through, through that course and through Dick Schulte's. And, and you could really voyage around the world, you know, while staying in that room, which is what ethnobotany, you know, gives people. I call it a gateway topic uh, to bringing people into science. It's just, it's extraordinarily engaging, you know. Well, tell us how ethnobotany has evolved since Schulte's era. Well, I think Schulte's really pioneered bringing together groups of people from other disciplines other than botany and working on a problem. Uh, for example, as Andy mentioned, psychoactive plants. And I think we've brought it along a little bit further. We, we've enlarged that collaborative of investigators. For example, uh, we have a project in Vanuatu where we're working with uh, not only botanists, um, mycologists, conservationists, foresters, and linguists. One of the things I'm fascinated by and have learned a lot from is my colleague David Harrison uh, from Swarthmore, who's a, a linguist, a very accomplished and prominent linguist who developed with his colleague Greg Anderson the, the talking dictionary to try and preserve it endangered languages. So in addition to doing botany, we're, we're running around showing the plants to elders, recording how they pronounce it, taking photographic images of the plants, and David puts it all on his talking dictionary. And really to, to provide cultural support to a community to help keep it together, there's nothing people are more fascinated by than they pull open a computer or you can open it up on your smartphone and and start showing pictures of plants, how they're pronounced in your ancient language, that people know who, who, who the speakers are. Many of them are gone. This is their legacy. And, and the uses of the plants. So it's just much more integrated. And I think there's a lot more respect also over the years for the value of the importance of the indigenous investigator, such that Starting in the 80s, I would be including indigenous people as co-authors on my paper. Schulte certainly honored indigenous peoples in a way that most others had not at the time. 
one leap that we've made is is uh, giving them academic credit for their contributions. You know, Michael, earlier on, um, you used the word primitive. And I think we have a certain hubris in the West about how evolved and intelligent we are. We've obviously made enormous scientific advances and created incredible microscopes and other tools to measure plants. And yet, Centuries ago, indigenous people without access to any of this equipment learned which plants were good as medicine, which ones were safe to eat, in some cases how to detoxify things that weren't safe, and they were using uh, their senses in this incredibly uh, rich way that perhaps you know we've lost the ability to use. Can, can you speak a little to uh, that term that you've uh, referred to, indigenous science, and, and what we can learn? Sure. What I've found is that indigenous peoples use the Western, so-called Western scientific method of trial and error, but I uh, add to it success. So trial, error, and success. You might taste that red berry because the uh, red berry that you ate in your village across the mountain uh, gave you a lot of energy, and you taste this one that looks similar. Maybe it gives you a stomach ache, so you spit it out, you don't eat it anymore. That's your trial and error. Or it uh, gives you powers that, you know, energy that you never thought you would have. So that's the success. As far as toxins go, uh, one example would be uh, a, an endemic cinnamon tree, Cinnamomum calorinensi, on uh, the island of Ponpe. Now that has a compound in it called saffron, which is a tumor promoter. And I wondered why people drank that as a healing tea and a tonic and with all that saffron in it. And so what we did, uh, working with a group from Lehman College, including a chemist, Ed Kennelly, and his student, Kurt Reinertsen, we looked at how indigenous people take the saffron out of that tea. We reproduced the tea in the way they made it. And we found there was no saffron in it, while in the bark, it was loaded with saffron. And the way they did it was to simply boil the water, which degraded the saffron, and titrate out the liquid and leave the bark behind. So I'm always just wondering, how do people come up with this? You know, any, any thoughts on that, Andy? Well, you know, one example is uh, ayahuasca, which has become such a prominent psychoactive substance these days i would never have thought that would happen but you know they're advertising ayahuasca uh experiences on the streets of tucson at any rate it, usually in the amazon this is made uh, it's an admixture of two plants one banisteriopsis copy uh the bark has a psychoactive substance called harmaline in it um, but doesn't really cause any visual changes and uh, most of the native peoples combine it with some other plant, often the leaves of a plant that has DMT in it, uh, dimethyltryptamine. DMT is a very powerful vis vision-inducing psychedelic, but you can't take it by mouth because an enzyme in the stomach, monoamine oxidase, degrades it. Uh, so when anthropologists first reported this and botanists this mixture, they said, well, the, uh, the DMT plant can't possibly have any effect. And the indigenous peoples always said that this was used to make the visions brighter. And I remember hearing in Schultes' class that they found this by trial and error. But when I was in the Amazon cooking up ayahuasca with uh, shamans, this profusion of plants, it's hard to imagine them saying, well, it's Tuesday, I'll try this leaf today. And when I would ask the shamans how they discovered uh, that they could mix these two together, they all gave the same answer. And it was that the that the first plant, that Banisteriopsis, showed them when they were intoxicated on it, this other plant. So that they found it through intuition stimulated by that natural experience. To me, that makes that's more logical than the explanation that this was trial and error. So I think there that people living close to nature, their intuitive senses of things are are much more developed. 
Body of Wonder is produced by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Internationally recognized for innovative health and wellness programs, evidence-based research, and clinical standards. The center offers listeners a wide range of free resources to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle, including online learning, meditations, and short videos. To find out more, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast. Mike, I have a practical question for you. Uh, What about the issue of intellectual property with regard to this kind of research? Because there's been a history uh, in the past of pharmaceutical companies and others uh, exploiting this indigenous knowledge uh, and then developing products for profit. And there's not been compensation either in terms of uh, giving intellectual credit to or, or monetary credit to the people who that they learned this from. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Andy. Um, in the last 30 years, really 40 years, starting in the 1980s, people's in our field in ethnobotany started saying, wait a minute, if these contributors are are intellectually uh, deserving of authorship, they're also intellectu- uh, financially deserving of any benefits that come from this. And the first real push came from the National Cancer Institute. Uh, we had a, a collection contract to collect Uh, 1,500 samples a year from around the New World tropics. And the person running that contract at the NCI at the time, Gordon Craig, said, and I want to make this a model of benefit sharing. And this was, again, in the late 80s, before people really thought about this. So the U.S. government actually pushed forward this idea that people were deserving of compensation. And so over time, we developed short-term compensation, medium-term, long-term, understanding that in a pharmaceutical research project, um, 99.9% of the plants will not have an economic yield. Um, So there were short-term benefits. For example, we worked with a a company then titled uh, Shaman Pharmaceuticals, now Jaguar uh, Pharmaceuticals, Jaguar Health, and they devoted a percentage of the cost of the field work to benefit the population in the short term. So Steve King, one of my graduate students, actually used funds and, and, and uh, had funds available and would ask the communities where he was working uh, what they wanted. Sometimes it was uh, an airstrip to bring people in and out in an emergency or barbed wire to keep their cattle from munching on the forest or a little museum that um, they could document their own culture. So these short-term benefits turned out to be really significant. And over the long term, in the case of a jaguar, a plant that they worked with called Croton lecklei or Sangre de Drago uh, was approved by the FDA for the treatment of chronic diarrhea in in patients that couldn't tolerate their uh, antiretroviral therapies and benefits uh, from the sales are are now going back to those communities in a lot of different ways. So, but it's not just financial benefits. I think uh, in many places, people are non-monetary. They value other things. So when I was working in Belize with Rosita Arvigo and her husband, Greg Shropshire, one of the primary folks that was our teacher was Donna Lehio Ponte, a Maya healer. And an early, early paper that I authored in the co authored in the early, I don't know, 90s, uh, identifying a plant that had potential anti cancer value. Uh, Donna Lehio Ponte was listed as one of the authors on that paper. And what he did with that paper was was nail it to the wall of his little house, his modest little house in Belize. And people would come in and he would show them. He had about, I don't know, 30 or 40 patients a day. He would show them, he would say, soy garantizado, I'm guaranteed. Look at this, look at this paper. I'm a published scientist. You, you, you know, you should pay attention to my uh, wisdom on healing. So it's, it's a lot of different things.
Andy, one of the things that we still hear sometimes from skeptics is there's no value whatsoever to botanicals now that we have the scientific methods to create pharmaceutical drugs. And yet in integrative medicine, we teach our fellows that there are medicinal plants that benefit human healing in areas where we have no medication. And I'm wondering if you could give an example or two. And then, uh, Michael, I'd like to turn to you. Well, Victoria, first of all, you know that for years I have argued that whole natural products with their complex mixtures of constituents have different and often better effects than isolated compounds. And for many years, uh, I was ridiculed for writing about that and saying that. That's really changed. I think there's been uh, appreciation of the fact that complex natural mixtures are different and valuable and research has changed. One example for, of what you asked for is uh, milk thistle, uh, saliva marianum. Uh, this is a, a non-toxic plant that has the remarkable ability to stimulate metabolism of hepatocytes, liver cells, and protect the liver from toxic injury. Uh, we don't have anything like that in conventional medicine. We, we know a lot of things that damage the liver, including a lot of our medically used drugs, uh, but we don't know anything that protects the liver. This has even been used intravenously as a treatment for deadly amanita mushroom poisoning. Uh, it's something you can take. I know students that take this before they go out to drink on an evening. People take it who have or exposed to toxic uh, volatile solvents, but an extremely useful plan. And we have nothing like that in conventional medicine. You just mentioned that we're beginning to appreciate the value of whole plants. And it seems like one of the places where that's coming through really strongly is cannabis, because even the lay, you know, people see folks selling, you know, CBD and, and they're somehow reassured there's no THC. And yet, you know, we know that it's the complexity of all of these different cannabinoids and terpenoids and, you know, other chemicals in cannabis that that gives it its remarkable uh, healing properties. Yeah, that's a particularly complex one with so many different active constituents. But this is the general pattern that plants have mixtures often of related compounds. You know, one might be there in the greatest amount and, and reproduce most of the interesting activity of the plant, but it's modified by all these secondary constituents that we've ignored until very recently. But as I say, there's really been a shift now in research, I think also in, in uh, practical knowledge of practitioners. Yes. And Michael, you were going to add well, no, I was wondering, Andy, can you get intravenous uh, milk thistle extract in this country? or is No, that not as far as I know. <laughs> I think the FDA has not approved it. So we do a lot of poison plant information and work with a poison information center um, uh, in this area. And there are always a half dozen people who collect ammonita mushrooms mistakenly, thinking they're other mushrooms. And 96 hours later, they're gone. Or they um, have a liver transplant. Right, if they're fortunate enough. But, you know, in Europe, you, you get the intravenous milk thistle and you survive with your liver. And there's a lesson there. You know, yep. Mother Nature has figured this out a long time ago. And we're just sort of catching up, which is why we're the primitive ones. <laughs> There are 30,000 medicinal plants that indigenous cultures have used, and we've only looked at 300, maybe, carefully. And out of that 300, 25% of our prescriptions in your local pharmacy you know, are based on. So there's a lot more to be done. Maybe we've gotten the low-hanging fruit, but now it's time to listen to the wisdom of Mother Nature. Michael, you also speak of another fascinating concept that plants can potentially direct activities of people. And you, you speak of a concept of calendar plants. Can, can you explain what those are? Sure. Uh, my colleague, Greg Plunkett, and I and, and others work, as I mentioned, in Vanuatu in the south, the southern islands, 
And there's one island, uh, for example, called a Nightjam Island. It's an island of, oh, seven or 800 people. And they have gardens. They grow most of what they consume. And they know to plant their gardens when certain plants flower. So when, when flowers appear on a certain plant, they know it's time to plant yams. When they appear on another plant, they know it's time to harvest yams. When the needles of casuarina, a large tree, turn brown, they know that the sun has shifted and that it's time not to work so hard. You know, stay out of the, the midday sun. It's too intense. Um, so the, the, the plants are telling them something. Since they're island peoples, they live in a marine habitat. And when certain other plants uh, flower, they know it's time to harvest sea urchins or certain fish because there's more fat, there's more meat in the, in the animals, the sea creatures. So plants really direct people's lives in, in that way. The message plants, uh, we also talk about if you... If you uh, are walking through a village in, and it's not yours, in the old days, people might attack you thinking you're a threat. Uh, but if you have certain species of plants that you put behind your ear, the message is, I come with no threat. I come in peace. So it, it's fascinating to study you know, the implied messages from plants as, as well as their actual uses. So it's much more than just attunement with the seasons as certain things come into flower. Yes, and also the alignment of the sun, for example, and the intensity of the sun. Uh, we have a grant to study indigenous concepts of daylight and its effect on their plants and its effect on their lives in Fiji and Vanuatu. And it, it's fac absolutely fascinating to watch local people observe how the sun impacts their lives and develop rituals to make rain. In other words, to hide the sun uh, when they want to plant their crops, things like that. Mike, you're a regular lecturer uh, to our classes of fellows uh, at our Center for Integrative Medicine, and your lectures are much appreciated. How much uh, other contact do you have with, with practicing physicians, and do you see a uh, greater interaction between ethnobotanists and, and practitioners? Well, I think the answer is a resounding yes at many different levels. Uh, next week, a group of fellows in emergency medicine under the uh, a wing of Lewis Nelson, who uh, Lewis and I recently co-authored a book, The Handbook of Poisonous and Injurious Plants. They're going to come to the garden for a tour of toxins, poisonous plants, to the New York Botanical Garden. And we get a lot of um, questions from emergency departments about what's this plant and what's that plant. We can't offer advice. As I say, my patients are green, but we can offer a determination of the species to allow the emergency room physician to move forward or not with an intervention. At the same time, New York City being an immigrant community, we do a lot of work with the Dominican community, for example, and have for many decades. The Dominicans use medicinal plants, and they also go to clinics and emergency departments when, the, uh, when they're seeking help. Now, the physicians in the emergency department or in the hospitals don't always understand plants, and they don't understand what their uses are and what people are attempting to treat. And so, uh, again, my colleague, Ina Vandenbroek, coordinates the program to teach physicians in our area cultural competency in dealing uh, with a patient use of, of plants. So, training physicians to be respectful, to be understanding, to speak the language of plants, and to be able to have an interaction with the particular immigrant group about what they've been using and how they can then alter their treatment accordingly. So lots and lots of contact with physicians and healthcare providers. So it gets me to a final question, which is what do each of you see as the future potential of plants in medicine? 
Well, I think it's tremendous. I think there is enormous value to uh, plant medicine, and I think this can go on side by side with pharmaceutical medicine. Uh, our pharmaceutical drugs are often very valuable for the management of, of uh, acute conditions of when the body is severely out of balance for getting them back in a balanced state. But when used long term, their negative effects often outweigh the benefits. Uh, toxicity, um, the potential in long term use to actually prolong or worsen conditions. And I think that the botanical preparations are much safer and often have a better quality of effect. And I'd love to see these both available to physicians and patients. And that doesn't mean just making herbal teas. I mean, we might be able to make whole botanical extracts, for example, in, in standardized form that physicians would be comfortable using. But I think there's a tremendous need to educate physicians about this world. And our center is certainly, you know, doing what we can to bring people up to speed. You know, I, I do a lot of work in the Pacific where the uh, clinics are rather bare because the field ship comes in once every six months. But growing around the clinics are gardens that are filled with medicines. And we've worked with a number of island nations to develop primary healthcare manuals based on plants, working with the local departments of health and leading physicians. And I remember a person in Pohnpei, uh, Mary David, during a cholera epidemic. Uh, she was in her 70s, maybe 80s at the time. Uh, she was living near one of the village clinics, and they had run out of medicine for the treatment of diarrhea. And she was waving this branch at me and said, but these kids, my grandchildren, who were the medical officers who were trained overseas, they don't remember that I would give them this plant, the guava tree, when they had diarrhea. And isn't it a shame that they're turning patients away? So that was actually the idea to develop these primary health care manuals. And then diabetes is a, is a huge problem in the Pacific, amongst other public health issues. And one of uh, my graduate students, Christopher Kitalon, who Andy knows well, for his dissertation, he worked on a plant called Filaria nisidae uh, in the Thymeliaceae family, but they call it mother of all medicine in Palau, Dalalakar. And they did a clinical trial uh, with a group of physicians, uh, both local and international, and they found that drinking a tea of this plant twice a day, uh, combined with exercise and diet, uh, substantially reduced hemoglobin A1C at no cost to the patient. In other words, a sustainable therapy. And because this was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, they parsed out the diet and exercise. And the T alone knocked the hemoglobin A1C down 0.6 in just 12 weeks. Now, the other issue with Dalalakar with this plant, it's sort of an entourage effect, I guess, of compounds because it also gives you energy. So the patients, the participants in this pilot clinical trial said, well, they had more energy to exercise and they weren't as hungry. So the reduction in hemoglobin A1C in this 12-week period was extraordinary. And it was from a plant that grows in everybody's yard. I like to think of that as side benefits as opposed to side effects. You know, the side benefit of additional uh, energy to be able to then do the additional salutogenic behaviors. Yes, and and one of your colleagues and uh, former fellows, uh, Steve, Dr. Stephen Dahmer, was with us on one of these trips to Palau, and he was trying uh, Dalalakar as a tea, and he just noticed that it was an energizer. You know, he. He reported that as one of its positive effects. So we, we've also tried to train physicians. Uh, Dr. Roberta Lee, another one of your former uh, fellows and colleagues, uh, and I put together an ethnomedical training program that we implemented in Palau and brought healthcare professionals into 
uh, the Pacific Islands to get firsthand experience in learning from our elders. Well, Michael, thank you so much uh, for your more than four decades of work in ethnobotany for training physicians uh, so that they have a greater awareness and, and obviously more tools at their fingertips and for all of the work you do. Thank you for teaching at our center. And it's wonderful to be on the podcast with you. Yes, indeed. Well, thank you very much. I, I've just so enjoyed my interactions with the center and all of the people that we've trained and all of the people that we've taken to the field and studied with. And, and it's just been a, a joy for me to watch the evolution of integrative medicine from those earliest days where people were saying, well, we can't study this. How do you do placebo acupuncture? It's impossible. To the days today where these are mainstream therapies. So congratulations to you both. And I do treasure our, our friendship and look forward to lots of things in the future. Thank you, Michael. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520 621 3950. Again, 520-621-3950. Or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Body of Wonder brought to you by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. If you like the show, please rate us five stars, follow the show, and leave a review. To learn more about integrative healing and the center, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast.